This church was being excavated the last time that I was here, and it's considered to be very, very old, as, as DeLake was saying. And she suggested that I tell you about the latest excavation that's really hitting the news in Israel, of all places, uh, about a church. Now, churches in Israel, as you know, are you know usually pretty late, crusader and what have you. Those of you that have been to Israel, most of you, remember Megiddo. And of course, right next to Megiddo, if you kept going past it, you know, on usual tours, they come in from a certain direction and then they double back. But if you kept going past it on the right, there was a prison. And the prison was put there, but deliberately built over the top of some old ruins because the Israelis who put it there didn't care about such things. So they just built over the top of it. But during some um, construction that was going on there and some prisoners were digging into the ground, they reopened the excavation that was there. They found uh, what appears to be the floor of a synagogue and what actually they found was the floor of a church. Now this came to light about 10 years ago, but lately, what they have done is they found that this might be so important that they evacuated the prison and they're in the process of tearing it down. And they're opening up this entire area as this ancient church. And the church that they found would be, obviously in Israel, a primarily messianic fellowship, but dedicated entirely to Christians. And it might be late second century which makes it the earliest exclusively Christian building ever found in the world. And on the floor, they just uncovered, it made news about three to four weeks ago, a huge mosaic, big one, dedication mosaic by a patroness of the building. In other words, she helped finance it, that in huge Greek letters, it's dedicated to the God Jesus. This is fascinating, and I don't know where this is going to all end up in the news and archaeologically speaking, but I just thought I would tell you that that's happening in Israel, but also what you're looking at here is one more thing. You know about the story of Laodicea, which we're about to read, and here you are, <laughs> I don't know if you like this, but you are today the church in Laodicea. But the good news is the church lasted hundreds of years after this letter was written. Now, the church that you go to, think about walking into your church building and say, is this going to be here in 500 years? You know, something's going to change, something's going to go. What about that? See, the church of Laodicea got past their moment of crisis, and it's right here. Finally, and to the angel of the church of the Laod in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus is speaking and he is saying, I am God. He doesn't mean he's the first thing created as the beginning of God's creation. It means that he was there at the beginning of God's creation of all people. John knows that and he said that in the very beginning of his gospel. Jesus says to the people here, virtually right under your feet. This temple wasn't here when this letter was written. Hadrian built this temple that you're standing in right now, so this wasn't even here then. The people, virtually right under your feet. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, when Jesus says that, you better listen. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white garments, what color were their garments here? Black. Remember that Laodicean wool that was glossy and shiny and desired all over the world. It's black garments. I desire that you buy from me white garments that you may clothe yourselves and, not, uh, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes. Because this is something else that came out of here. There was a medicinal salve that was renowned in this city that went out all over the Roman world that was supposed to cure some sorts of eye diseases. We're not really sure what, but it was definitely popular and in demand. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you can see. You're blind, you're poor, you're pitiable, you're naked. And those whom I love, we needed to hear this. I reprove and discipline. He didn't hate him. Oh, he, this church makes him sick, but he loves him. He doesn't hate him. Those I love, I reprove and discipline. 
So be zealous and repent. Don't just repent halfway. Repent all the way. I want to stop there for a second because we all know the story of hot, cold, and lukewarm. Or maybe you don't. Now, as DeLake explained on the bus, this was a very wealthy city. They're in competition with Heropolis over there. You can see the white where we just were at the calcium carbonate falls of the hot springs. Over in this direction is Colossi at the foot of the Taurus Mountains. And you've got the, uh, um, the tributary of the Meander River coming right through uh, Colossi. It's snowmelt. It's really, really cold. These guys didn't want to compete with them. We're better. They didn't want to compete with Colossae, which was a dying city, and, but we're better. And so they imported by aqueduct from hot springs, either in Heropolis or perhaps along with another group of hot springs that were further over in this direction. And they could have brought them about three and a half miles here by aqueduct. And then from the cold water, ice cold water from Colossae down in that direction, bringing it in here that came through pipes. Now, there are two theories on this. DeLake told you one. The theory was that once the water, the hot water got here from Heropolis or the nearby hot springs about three and a half miles away, and the cold water got here from Colossae, this was their water source. And by the time it got here, it was lukewarm. Lukewarm, cold down to lukewarm, hot down to lukewarm, and you had that. But the other possibility is this. Because the aqueduct used pipes, the remnant of the city pipes, but some of the aqueduct pipes are still around the dig here. They're lined with minerals, so you know where they came from. But the pipes are embedded inside the aqueduct. You don't want to expose to the air because of evaporation and all of that. So most aqueducts were not troughs. They were a series of pipes embedded in these giant bridges that they sent across. And over time, when you have lots of hot water coming through it, if it's consistently hot, it becomes insulated and it does get here hot. You have spas here. They can heat the water up, but isn't it better to get natural hot water? And that's a possibility that it arrived here lukewarm, but it could have also arrived here hot. And then from, uh, again, the same process, except on the opposite end with the cold, from Colossae coming in as well. They could have gotten ice water. Remember, you had the, the different rooms of the, uh, of the um, uh, Roman baths. You had the Frigidarium, the Tepidarium, and the Cal... Cal I can never say that word. Cal Caldarium, Caldarium. Okay, yes, I can never say that word properly. Where it was, the, that was the, uh, of course, the sauna part of it. But you had the cold plunge, you had the the hot plunge, and then you had the sauna, and it would have worked really well here for that. And you you haven't been here on a hot day. This place is miserable when it's hot. You want the cold water. Cold water was refreshing. Hot water was therapeutic. But I don't know how many times you've heard it taught this way, and I have not only heard it taught this way, but I have taught it this way, and I've backed away from it after I came here, that hot water is therapeutic. If you want to get better, soak in hot mineral water. That's why the people went over there, and the people here wanted a piece of the action. Soak in the hot water, it's got minerals in it, it's therapeutic. You like a hot mineral bath, don't you? Especially if you're from Napa, you've got Calistoga up there. But you know, cold water. You ever got out of a hot bath and jumped into a cold plunge? Oh, it's refreshing, right? You just kind of get all excited. You know, it's great. Or on a hot day like today, when we're done here, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get back to that bus? You're going to go for the water and you're going to want it to be cold. Why? Cold water is refreshing. We have taught consistently in the Evangelical Church in America that on this, hot was boiling, it's on fire for the Lord, you're bubbling over for God. Cold, your faith is out. There is no life in that faith, but, but, at least you're not a hypocrite. But in the middle, it's a hypocrisy. You're trying to act hot, but you're actually cold, and in the middle, there's hypocrisy, and it's taught this way. Have you heard this before? I have. And I even taught it that way, guilty as charged. Hot is therapeutic. You want it. You can not only soak in it, you can drink it. It makes you better. Cold is refreshing. You want it. It's good for you. It makes you feel better. It refreshes you. It's the aspect of it that just makes you go, do that again. I love it. Oh, yeah. Lukewarm, however... If you're drinking lukewarm mineral water, whether it was cold to start or hot to start, you can taste all the impurities in it. And it was considered by the Laodiceans as toxic. 
And if they drank lukewarm water, stick a finger down your throat and they would vomit it up because they believed, and this was a very superstitious world back then, that that was toxic. Hot is good. When we say bubbling over for the Lord and all of that, that is an Americanism that has nothing to do with what really happened right here where you're standing. Hot was therapeutic. Cold was refreshing. This is what Jesus wants his church to be. Somebody comes into our midst and they're better for it. They're healthier for it. Even if they don't believe, they come in and they know I have been ministered to. In other words, I have my, I, I'm healthier. I'm better. I, I, therapeutic things have happened to me while I've been among these people. Or cold. Refreshing. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, it's the gifts. It's all the, the you know, big long list. Jesus characterized the Holy Spirit's ministry, regardless of the different categories you could attach to that ministry, as living water. Living water, think babbling brook, artesian well, waterfall, nice mountain stream, something coming out of the mountains of the Taurus Mountains from snowmelt. Living water, it's not stagnant, it's not in a well, it's not in a cistern, it's it's moving, it's refreshing, it's pure, it's life-giving, it's health-promoting. This, this is what the Holy Spirit looks like coming out of us, feels like coming out of us. We don't often think of it this way. So many Christians who claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. We're living water. When He is at work in us, what comes out of us when others are around us is refreshment, and they are refreshed. Isn't this an amazing atmosphere just being here with all of that going on in the background too? This is fine. This is what we are to be as Christians. This is what Jesus expects. And when we're not refreshing, that means refreshing other people that they're just, they get around us, oh, or therapeutic, they get around us and they're better for it. He says, you're toxic. How do you get that way? You're impure. I can taste all the impurities. And that was Laodicea's problem. Yeah, they were rich, but they held that as God blessing them, God prospering them. Well, we pray for prosperity and blessing. That's not a bad thing to do, but they had it. And it made them very much like the people in Sardis, complacent. The same thing with the people in Ephesus, by the way. When we get there tomorrow, I'll have to mention that too. But hot is good. Cold is refreshing. Lukewarm was bad. But the first two, top and bottom, they're both fantastic, and they are a work of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus wants for His church and from His church. Finally, and I'll finish with this, verse 20, you know this. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. When we think about this, I remember that painting of Jesus dressed very tall with brown hair and blue eyes and very pale complexion, knocking on a door. Remember? Uh, you know, outside of a door, and it's a very, very meaningful painting. But they miss the point. Because now they're, an, like I said, every time a shovel goes into the ground, something wonderful comes back up again, and you find all kinds of great things. And now with this, I hold, stand at the door and knock, it relates to something else here. You see, when Jesus says this, those whom I love, not those who I am angry with, those who are my followers, true, but those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So what's the concluding, conclusion of that? Well, it's simply this. Way back in the day when, especially among the Jewish people, and John of all people would have known this, that marriages in Israel, Judea, and among the Jews, at least in this part of the world, and among the Greeks, but you know, depending on what they did, they were typically arranged. But if a man fell in love with a woman outside of an arrangement, and for whatever reason that might have been allowed, we, among the Jews, especially the Galilean Jews, they had a procedure. For the man to be held accountable for his relationship with this bride-to-be. His friends would gather, maybe his family, and he would go over to his hopeful bride's house. 
and he would go up to the house and start pounding on the door. And while he's doing it, he was required to sing love songs to her. And she just waited. He's pounding on the door and he's singing love songs over and over and over again. And finally, she ends the torture and the embarrassment. I'm sure all the people are standing around laughing and giggling while he's doing this. Maybe he's having a good time. Maybe he's somewhat humiliated, probably having a good time. And she will come down from her upper loft area because most people lived in the higher parts of the house. She comes down, she opens the door and she lets him in. And then the procedure was she has, in the time that he's been pounding and singing, she has set a table for him and she comes in and he eats with her saying, her saying to him, I'll take you. Him saying to her, I love you. I want you. This is the way people fell in love back in the days of Jesus. We don't often hear about that. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice, I love you. Open the door. I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. It brings a whole new conclusion to the church of Laodicea, which apparently repented and thrived for hundreds of years. That being the evidence right there. Isn't this great? It's great. Welcome to Laodicea, Church of the Laodiceans. Here you are today. Thank you, Father, and we bless your name for this place, for your message to us. Help us to be hot and cold. Forbid us to be lukewarm. In Jesus' name, amen.